Good morning, everyone. We will uh, start in about one minute, um, but so that I don't take up too much of Ross's time, I just wanted to say hello to everyone and welcome to our final uh, webinar for, for this, I guess we would call it fiscal year, but uh, do be prepared that there'll be lots of fun stuff coming up in the fall. Uh, and to any of you who joined us at the National SEL Conference, thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to your participation um, with SEL for PA and think, fun things that are going on in the state and beyond. Ross, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome, thank you, Stephanie. And so, um, welcome. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about administrative things for about 60 seconds, so that if anybody misses these things, they will not have missed anything as they come in. So, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate uh, you taking some time out of your end of the school year Thursday to join us for this webinar. And so, I'm gonna start sharing my screen as well, so that you can see what I see. Uh, I'm Ross Whiting. I am uh, primarily the, the president of Dogwood Consulting. It's an evaluation, organizational development, and ad advocacy group that works with nonprofits, K through higher educational institutions, and philanthropic organizations to improve, uh, demonstrate, and enhance the impact of those organizations. Um, I also have a ton of other roles related to social emotional learning, which is why I'm here today. I am the co-lead of SEL for PA with my colleague, Karen Lehman, who is also here from the Center for Schools and Communities. I am the chair of the SEL for NJ Youth Mental Health Advocacy Collaborative, which I will be talking about today as well. And I am the strategy and communications consultant and the former principal investigator of the Clayton Model Pilot Program, which is a tier two, tier three uh, support system for social, emotional, mental well-being needs uh, that is being implemented in 10 elementary schools across the state of New Jersey. And so we're gonna talk about a lot of those things. Uh, and so thank you all for being here on this end of the school year Thursday uh, with me. And so before we get started, we'll just go over and do a quick overview of what we are going to do. I will talk about the two case studies that we, were, we are going to look into today. Uh, and then I'm going to talk through the ways that you can start to develop frameworks to advance social, emotional, and mental health policies at all different kinds of levels. And this is just a general framework building. And I'll also provide some case studies and examples of how uh, some things were, we, were developed, primarily in New Jersey, uh, as, um, as they have some uh, more advanced social, emotional, and mental health policies uh, at the state level. So we'll talk through developing and refining goals, identifying partners in a viable meeting format, strengths and challenges, uh, including developing values, vision, mission, and goals. We'll talk about refining and defining that vision, mission, and goals. And then the activities, actors, organizational structure, audiences, and meetings that you might need to uh, establish to advance some of your policy practices. And then I will briefly touch on the work we are doing in Pennsylvania right now. We have spent the last year developing this same kind of framework in Pennsylvania, developing SEL for PA. And so I will share the vision with you and how you can join that. If you happen to be joining us from Pennsylvania, we would love to have you in that work. Um, and then finally, some fast advice for the group. Everyone loves pizza, right? Uh, so we're, we're sharing, we're sharing the pizza. And so I would love it if you could all hop in the chat and share something related to student social, emotional, mental well-being that you think is incredibly important to focus on in the policy level of the near future? What are the things that get you fired up about student social, emotional, mental well-being? What are the big needs? And so take a minute, um, find the chat, and uh, feel free to post what you think is important. Okay, got my chat. Great, Karen, thank you for posting the SEL for PA one. Appreciate that. Connecting to the community, positive adults, youth of voice, absolutely. Support strength-based promoting positives. Yes, growth-based and asset-oriented kind of supports. One adult in the school couldn't agree more. That is a great thing to focus on. Community support and understanding. Access to preventative well-being 
and licensed counselors. Integration and access in the school system, totally agree. Support for families and school staff to have the time and space they need to focus on SEL and well-being needs. Yes, bandwidth is critically important in these areas. And we know many times um, there are a lot of competing responsibilities in the schools, which makes bandwidth uh, hard to find. Engaged administrator, critical to have administrative buy-in. Trained mental health staff in schools, couldn't agree more. Uh, counselors, SEL specialists, child life specialists, social workers, those people who can provide specific supports to kids, great. Yeah, I'm going to heart that too. That was, that's good. Okay, thank you for sharing. Yes, and so a lot of overlap here too, connection to community. We're talking about asset-based, strengths-based approaches to social, emotional, mental well-being for kids, the training for kids, uh, for, for staff to support students and schools, also extending that to caregivers, I think, and making sure that there's access to community members for asset-based, strengths-based, social, emotional, mental well-being supports, adult and community support. Thank you, Kayla, for posting that. Um, absolutely agree with all of those things. And so I think you'll see some of those things in today's case studies. Um, and so I will dive into some of that work. So our two case studies that you will see kind of repeated as examples of how to build social, emotional, mental well-being supports are here. The first on the left side of the screen is the Child Connection Center. Uh, it, the, a Child Connection Center is established in an elementary school to provide primarily tier two and tier three social, emotional, mental well-being support. So we're talking about small group instruction or individual instruction. Um, and then there's about, um, there's a little bit of time for universal instruction in these Child Connection Centers as well. And so the Clayton Model Pilot Program's coordinator is Kate Hallinan. If you would like her email address, I can provide that at the end if you want to find more uh, about this. Kate is very receptive to inquiry. Um, I am the strategy and communications consultant for the Clayton Model Pilot Program. So I do a lot of communication with legislators um, and policymakers about this work in the state of New Jersey. I also want to highlight Celine Thompson, who is the current principal investigator of the evaluation. I was the principal investigator of the evaluation and then left about uh, two years ago to form my own organization, do my own uh, evaluation organizational development. But Celine is an excellent principal investigator. I hired her while I was there. She is a fantastic social, emotional, mental well-being evaluator, and I'm very glad she is the principal investigator. And so the goal of the Child Connection Center is this is to pilot an agile, responsive, trauma-informed, school-based social, emotional learning model in elementary schools across New Jersey. It is currently in its third year of implementation of five as a state supported initiative out of the New Jersey Department of Education. It was originally organized, uh, we started organizing the work um, when I was at Rutgers University in fall of 2019 through the winter of 2020. I think we all remember what happened in the winter of 2020. Uh, so that was a really tough, uh, tough go for a little bit there. Uh, an ongoing implementation. We are now implementing this work. As I said, we're in year three. This will take place through summer 2026. We just got notification the other um, last week that it will be in the, in the governor's budget again. And so we expect that budget to be signed and for this to be funded another year uh, for a, a fourth year in the coming year of implementation in, in those elementary schools. The activities we're currently doing include program implementation. So students are receiving direct supports and services there is ongoing evaluation and two levels of evaluation are happening. We're looking at outcomes evaluation for students and teachers as they engage in social emotional learning supports and mental well-being supports and uh, evaluation of school climate at large. So we're looking how schools change in general, how they change their processes to better integrate social emotional mental well-being needs. And we are doing, which is my role, a lot of advocacy. So our goal in the next couple of years is to get another law passed in the state of New Jersey that supports more expansive tier two, tier three, social, emotional, mental well-being resources. Um, and, the, and the general approach for the Child Connection Center, if you want to think about it, this is bandwidth in schools. And so what this looks like is it's a shared service. It, it exists in what is called a special service school district, which is a centralized school district that are generally county-based in New Jersey. The SEL specialists are actually employed by that district and then push into the elementary schools that they're serving. Their only role 
is to provide social, emotional, mental well-being supports to, to the schools that they're in. About 75% of their time is spent providing small group or individual instruction. And another 25% of their time is spent doing some universal SEL with whole classes, um, doing teacher training uh, with teachers to make sure teachers are aware of the strategies that they can use in their classroom, and coordinating resources, social, emotional, mental well-being resources across the school. So schools have all kinds of resources. These people are there to tie them together. Um, and so that's one thing we will talk about. And I, I'm using this one because it is, it's been implemented now for four years. We've been doing this work now for four years. It's well established and we've got it running. The other one, which is much more recent, um, is the SEL 4NJ Youth Mental Health Advocacy Collaborative. Um, and the Youth Mental Health Advocacy Collaborative is a group of statewide stakeholders and leaders who are working to organize and align disparate youth mental health systems that exist in the state of New Jersey. So the state of New Jersey is doing a great job funding a lot of different social, emotional, mental well-being resources, but unfortunately those are pretty disparate and disconnected at the moment. And those systems do not talk to each other well. And so the goal of this group is to look far in the future. We're looking at 2026 for alignment of those resources and better communication between the agencies who are implementing those resources. And so that's uh, that's the short of that. We organized about um, over a year ago now, February 2023. It includes quarterly meetings. We have 10 members, and those members include um, they include the statewide organization of administrators in New Jersey. They include the School Counselors Association. They include um, the Garden State Schools Coalition, uh, community schools groups, statewide groups who are interested in advancing social, emotional, mental well-being needs of students. And so the leaders of those groups primarily. The activities that we're engaged in right now, we need a landscape so we can say, here are the systems as they exist in New Jersey. And so we're working with the state to get a budget resolution passed in New Jersey that will support a landscape of youth, social, emotional, mental well-being resources. And so this is much more recently organized. And so I wanted to highlight something that was recently organized as well so that you have an idea about um, the kind of span and, and challenges that exist with both of these different approaches and groups. All right, I will also say, I have the chat up here on one of my other screens. And so if you have a question, uh, you feel free to type it in chat or raise your hand. This is ask away. The goal of this group and this conversation today is to provide some examples, but also for you to place this work and these, these approaches within your own context and within your own interest. And so if you're like, well, I don't know how quite it would work in this area, please feel free to ask. There is no barrier uh, and I'm happy to answer. The other thing I'll also say is I'll follow up with anybody afterwards if you're interested in advancing some policy initiative at, at any level that you are thinking of, school, to state, to national, I will talk about it because I'm very interested in advancing this work uh, and want to be supportive as we build networks of people who are also engaged and interested in this work. Uh, the bar for entry is low. Let's have a Zoom coffee. Uh, if you live in Southeastern PA or New Jersey, uh, that's close to me, please, let's have coffee. We can... We can talk, uh, I'm happy to be accessible to all of you. All right, so how do, you, how do you do that? We've got these two different groups that are up and running. And so what you're gonna see is all of my slides are going to look exactly the same. And I did that for a reason so that you can navigate each slide easily. The things that I, the questions that I want you to be thinking about and you to be chewing on are always going to be at the bottom of the slide. So if you look in that orange box at the bottom, you see four questions down there. Each slide will have questions for you to be thinking about as you think about what you might need to engage in to develop some, um, some advocacy and policy work in your own context. And so what I'm gonna ask you to do, if you, if you can uh, take notes yourself on those things, if you are interested in that, pull up a Word doc, uh, grab a little scrap paper and write down what you think is the most interesting um, answers to these questions if you can. And I will also say that some of these questions will not be able to answer, be able to be answered today because you actually have to engage in the process of organizational building before you can answer some of these questions. And I'll make sure that I highlight those. The other pieces of this are the two case studies, which we'll see in the middle of every slide. And so I'll talk through what it looks like to develop and refine a goal here for both of these case studies. 
And I will note it, I will note that I included two case studies because the processes for these were both drastically different. And so I want to highlight that goal, goals are different and approaches will change depending on the stakeholders, depending on the goal, depending on the audiences, all kinds of contextual factors. And so I wanted to provide you a couple of different examples of how this work might be uh, engaged in in the future. And so the first step, which we kind of hyped out here, I've got a lot of notes here in the chat about things that you are all passionate about, organizing policy initiatives around. The first thing you have to do is develop an initial goal. And the way that works is you identify a problem, a goal, a gap, an opportunity, and organize a statement of purpose to prepare to communicate that to other people. And so this is an entirely individual act. Before you go talk to anybody else, you have to have a good concept of how you wanna pitch the work that you want to do. And so the first thing you will do is this. So for the Clayton Model Pilot Program, our goal was to develop a pilot for this, for this work. It existed in Clayton Public School District in Southern New Jersey, one school only. Um, and I was lucky enough to be the evaluator of it, saw amazing student outcomes, socially, emotionally, academically for students. And so my goal was to say, you know what, this is a thing that I think should be in every school. We need a state funded, state supported, rigorously evaluated pilot. And so my goal here was to pilot and evaluate the, an agile, responsive, trauma-informed, school-based, social, emotional learning mo model in elementary schools across New Jersey. I will also initially, I will say that initially our goal was to um, pilot this in three schools. Um, and when we had the meeting with the legislator who eventually took this up and ran with it, he said, how about three counties? And so you have to be able to be responsive to the people who you are communicating to as well. We didn't end up in three counties, which I'm very glad for because that's a lot of uh, expansion in a very short period of time. We were in 10 schools. And so related to that, our focus was on policy change primarily and funding related to student social emotional support in New Jersey. And the primary uh, reason for that is most of the social, emotional, and mental well-being initiatives that were state supported in New Jersey were universal. So they were classroom based or whole school based. There were very few direct service social emotional learning models, none that were funded by the state. They were either funded at the local level or funded by a philanthropic organization. And so we wanted to institutionalize this policy at the state level. And so that was our overarching goal there. For SEL for NJ, the Youth Mental Health Advocacy Collaborative, that YMHAC, every time you see that is the Youth Mental Health Advocacy Collaborative. I don't know. It's a very long name. So we, just, we call it YMAC. Uh, so you might hear me say YMAC. Our goal is very different. This was also established four years after the Clayton model. And I had a good understanding of kind of state level policy on youth, social, emotional, mental well-being and recognized that there were disparate systems serving kids across the state and that there's definitely redundant administrative systems and systems that were not communicating with each other. And so my initial goal was to organize a group of statewide stakeholders to advocate for better aligned youth mental health systems in New Jersey. And this was a very simple, um, simple goal to start because I didn't know exactly how to navigate that or where to go. I started with a broader goal and then narrowed it with my group. Um, and so that brings us to the things that you are passionate about. And so the four questions that I ask at the outset of any policy development work, and I did this by the way, for, with SEL for PA and for SEL for PA over the last year. Uh, and you'll see the vision at the end of this as well, which is the outcome of that. These four questions here drove the development and refining of a goal. What is the goal or gap or opportunity you see? Who does it affect? What change would you like to see? And why do you want to see this change? Um, and if you've got some time now and you've got some scrap paper and a, a, or a Word document, feel free to jot it down. If you are feeling exceptionally brave, which I would welcome, you can put it in the chat and we can all see what kind of things you're thinking about. Um, and I'm also, by the way, happy to share this slide deck with, with you as well, Karen. I'll make sure that it gets to, to you and Michael and we can, we can disseminate the slide deck as well. Make sure people have access to this. And so that's step one. You've got your goal. 
congratulations. You're, you're working on it right now and you're going to refine it. But now you have to identify who cares about this uh, and how you're going to connect with them. And so the next step is to identify partners and a viable meeting format. I always put the word viable in uh, some kind of emphasis because you want to make sure that the people who care most about this are able to engage with you in the process of developing this. And in some cases, like is the case of the Youth Mental Health Advocacy Collaborative, I'm dealing with state level executive directors and presidents and people who have competing responsibilities. And so ensuring that they had access to this in a way that was not going to suck up a ton of their time, but was going to be high impact was incredibly important. Um, and so I'll start with the Youth Mental Health Advocacy Collaborative, even though it's listed there second. The partnerships for that group were focused on state or regional leadership positions or experts in social, emotional, mental well-being. And so I'm thinking people who have um, who are embedded in universities, who have literal research experience in these areas, or state-level organizations who are developing initiatives focused on student social, emotional, mental well-being, or have a stake in advancing student social, emotional, mental well-being. And so we ended up with 11 members total, including myself, who are meeting about quarterly. I will say that since we have in the last, in, it's budgeting season uh, for state budgets, which some of you may be aware of, in the last uh, three months in particular, we have met monthly and I have met almost weekly, if not more, with some of the people who are also doing some of the advocacy work around the budget resolution for that work. And so there is some need at times to be flexible in these meeting formats, um, but none of those meetings that I'm that are weekly are requiring the whole group. Everything up until that point had been quarterly and had been driven on literally the process that I am describing you today to you today, how to develop as a group, what communication vehicles to use, how to advance the work in general. And so this is the identification phase who we're caring about. For the Clayton Model Pilot Program, it was a much different position. I was a, uh, in a, at the time an associate director at the Senator Walter Rand Institute for Public Affairs at Rutgers University Camden. Um, and we were evaluating the Clayton model within the Clayton Public School District. And so I was the principal investigator of that work. At the outset, there were only two partners and two stakeholders in that. It was a much more clear cut uh, group of people and we already had an established working relationship as a result of the ongoing evaluation that was happening with the Child Connection Center. And so we had initial meetings weekly, and those weekly meetings were already established and already accessible uh, for all the partners involved. Those meetings included their program director, they included some of their implementation, social emotional learning experts, and uh, about every other week would also include their superintendent who was very invested in this work. And I will just shout him out very quickly, Nick Kutsianis. He is a superintendent of Clayton Public School District, incredibly supportive of, of this work and would also be happy if any of you have administrators who wanna talk administrator to administrator or you are an administrator, Nick is very accessible and he would happily talk about advancing this work in your own context as well. So feel free to DM me uh, if you're interested in that conversation. And so how do you do that? What, how do you look around and identify who is right for this work and what's the meeting format look like? Well, the first thing that we did, especially for the Youth Mental Health Advocacy Collaborative is regional and organizational spider webbing. And I think of that as finding a node, a person who you know has information about this field and then asking them who else might be engaged in this work? Who else might be interested? The other way you can do this if you have a broader network that you're looking to build is find people with communication networks that exist already. So if you've got somebody with a larger statewide mailing list, for example, like the New Jersey, uh, New Jersey Association of School Psychologists or something of that nature, then you can go out and, and disseminate your information from this communication point there. But the whole goal is to find people who might care enough to invest time to reach the goal. Because you are asking people generally, in many cases for free, to invest their time in these policy initiatives. And so then you can ask them, how do you prefer to meet? What is the easiest thing for you? 
Is it a doodle poll uh, to collectively decide? Or is your organization large enough that you can send, you can establish a meeting and whoever is able to come, if you can establish it enough months in advance, has enough warning to attend those meetings? Um, and then finally, some, some considerations for membership that you should think about. Um, are there similar organizations who are doing similar work in the space that you're occupying? Where does funding come from for these things? And including people maybe from philanthropic organizations or state organizations who might be interested in funding some of that work. Where are the power connections related to this? And when I think about power, I think about people who are already doing advocacy work at the state level or at the local level, wherever you are. Uh, who, who is talking about this work the most and is the most visible? Um, and those can be official, like elected positions. And they can also be people who just, you know, at the local level, show up to every school board meeting and say something about, you know, our kids are, they really need more. Um, and uh, connections, you look at connecting nodes, people who have connections to other people who can help you spider web out. And then finally, I think a very important piece of identifying partners in a meeting format is identifying who is missing. And so in the Clayton model pilot program, initially we did not have student voice uh, included in that. It was an elementary school-based social emotional learning program. And so initially we weren't quite sure how to navigate the inclusion of student voice in that program, but we recognized it was missing. And so we found ways, especially with some of our older students who are second, third, fourth, fifth grade to get feedback from them that was more than just saying, oh, I like hanging out with Miss M, uh, which, is, which is not quite enough feedback for us to really shape the way we implement our work. And so you have to look around and recognize when somebody is missing at the table. And I also wanna take a point here and recognize that you should be paying attention to traditionally uh, underrepresented and traditionally marginalized groups. And some, some of those categories could include racial groups who are traditionally marginalized and underrepresented. They could include socioeconomic groups. They could include um, gender and gender queer groups, especially we are in Pride Month now. Let's, let's uh, be as inclusive as we possibly can in thinking about who is not at the table and conversations in these groups and making sure that we have voices who are representative of the experiences of the people who these policies might affect. Um, and so I just listed a few, but there are a, a plethora of socially constructed categories. Disability, thank you, absolutely. Ability, no question. Um, and especially in social emotional spaces, people with communication differences and disabilities, critically important to focus on in these areas and think about inclusion in those areas as well. Um, and so pay attention to it uh, and, and acknowledge when somebody is not at the table and how you wanna bring them into that conversation. Okay, and so if you have done uh, some of your homework in this area, you have identified a partner in a meeting format. Um, and now it is time to do a little bit of landscaping, to understand a little bit more about the context. You have your initial goal, but now you have collective wisdom. You've got a group of people who you can bounce ideas off of, who you can think with, who you can refine ideas with. And so it's time to collect and organize information from people. For the Clayton Model Pilot Program, this was a pretty straightforward process because we had been doing evaluation with that program for the last several years. And so we had lots and lots of data from those evaluations that were focused on um, student social emotional outcomes, uh, which were exceptional. So you saw significant changes in student social emotional outcomes using a valid and reliable scale. We also saw significant improvements in math and language arts grades for students who engaged in tier two and tier three supports that persisted compared to their peers who did not engage in the Child Connection Center over time. So once you've done social, emotional, uh, a mental well-being supports with the Child Connection Center, your grades improve permanently, essentially. We did process evaluation for years with staff and implementation in schools. Yes, I can explain more about the tiers and supports. I'll just I'll just run through this real quick and then I'll, I'll run I'll run on under that. Um, and then we also talked to the Child Connection Center staff to understand how implementation is working. We talked to administrators within the school to understand how it was embedded within the school system. And so we had a lot of internal information with which to organize our groups. 
And so the tier system that I'm thinking about just briefly, thank you, Mary, for, for pointing that out. Sometimes, by the way, as a presenter, it's, it's hard for me to know what, uh, what you all don't know. And so feel free to chat and I'll answer any questions you've got. Um, the tier system is essentially based off the multi-tiered system of supports, which is a, uh, an evidence-based supports provision program that can be implemented for academics, social emotional learning needs, a variety of different student supports, primarily in schools. And so uh, tier one is your universal support and a universal support would reach a large number of kids. And so when you think about a large number of kids, that can be a span two. You're thinking about like a classroom of kids all the way up to an entire school of kids. So when you think of a tier one support, you're thinking of something that is like maybe a lesson on kindness uh, in an elementary school. You're thinking of something that is uh, a lesson on how to talk to kids um, and improve social relationships within a classroom. It's something uh, that everybody gets. A tier two support uh, is a more targeted support and it's usually identified for a small group. And so when you think about tier two, typically tier two is a small group specialized support. So you're looking at identifying kids who have a specific need in an area and then providing some kind of support to that small group of kids to bolster and strengthen skills and whatever identified need area exists. And then the highest level of support is tier three support, and that is individual support. So a kid has a particularly high need in a specific area. Uh, and an example of this area might be, let's say somebody recently experienced um, a death in the family and they're, uh, they're experiencing grief, obviously. And they're going to need additional support. They're going to need some counseling, some, some individual support in order to prepare them and, and help them process that experience. A tier one support might be individual grief counseling for a kid. Um, it might also be things like, um, you know, a kid did not qualify for um, specialized supports through an IEP, but needs additional support focusing. And so it's developing strategies to focus in a classroom in a one-on-one -on -one setting a less obtrusive tier two support for that might be in a small group instead of in an individual group. And so when I talk about tiers, I'm talking about tier one as a broad, uh, a broad project kind of implementation, tier two as a smaller group of focus, and tier one is individual, and those are generally the highest needs. Um, yes, thank you, Stephanie. Teamwork. Great. All right, and so um, on WIMAC, on the Youth Mental Health Advocacy Collaborative, I've got this group of people who are uh, leaders, statewide leaders now in a, in a room. What do we do with them? In this group, it looked like group wide, it looked like group brainstorming and data review. We all had resources that we could come with related to especially youth mental health in New Jersey, and we just brought them all together and then did collective brainstorming about our, what our state's strengths and challenges are, what the gaps are, and then work to establish vision, uh, mission, vision, and goals together. And so what you wanna do in this area, if you look at our bottom box, is focus on the collective goal, goal of the group. What information do you wanna collect and who do you wanna collect it from? And then once again, who is missing from that conversation? Um, in this, once again, when we were doing the Clayton model in particular, there was no student voice involved in this initial round of goal setting. We are now including a lot more student voice in all of our evaluations and in all of our um, advocacy work on behalf of the program as well. And then you also wanna think about who and how you will analyze the data that you get. This does not have to be super complicated. For the, for the Clayton model pilot program, it was pretty advanced statistical analysis for some pieces. It was qualitative analysis for other pieces. Um, to identify themes within uh, different areas. But for the Youth Mental Health Advocacy Collaborative, we collectively did it together and just narrowed, narrowed, narrowed as a group until we all came to a common understanding of what we thought would be effective for the group. And great, so you've collected this data. Now you've got to define the group purpose. You really need some kind of vision, value, goals to be better established. And so for the Clayton Model Pilot Program, uh, oh, let me just talk about, you want to create an environment in which there's an open forum for group feedback and group refinement. And the general way that I approach this work is through brainstorming. I love brainstorming. 
for many people, brainstorming is just a term that you throw out and you're kind of like, oh, we're all thinking together. For me, I like to think of brainstorming as an actual process. It is the, the um, non-judgmental sharing of information to get to a specific goal. And non-judgmental is incredibly important because what happens if you're brainstorming effectively is somebody could throw out a wild idea that is not will not meet the goal that you are heading towards. But often what happens is that wild idea is refined by another group member and say, oh, well, you know, that we can't do that, but we what if we did this that's related to that? And so it's the non-judgmental piece is incredibly important. So even if you're not getting right away to the thing that you want, you can eventually work together as a group towards that. And it creates this curious and open and kind kind of conversation around your shared group goals. So for the Clayton model, oh, I just skipped it. Let's not do that. For the Clayton model pilot program, we looked to develop a pilot proposal that included three elementary schools, um, and then the development of a program and evaluation criteria in those three elementary schools. And that was literally just a document. For this, we worked to refine a document and agree on it together, what this pilot might look like. And it was essentially initially a replication of what was already happening in the schools. And so though we just had to scale it up a little bit to three schools, and make sure that we would have enough um, understanding and resources to build capacity within those schools. Not a super complex process as some of that existed. For the Youth Mental Health Advocacy Collaborative, it was a different process. We did independent drafting based on our brainstorming data and then refined that into the vision that you see here. Every child in every school community receives proactive, coordinated, accessible, and effective youth mental health services. And so then we operationalized all of the different aspects of the vision collectively together. We all looked at this, we all refined it, we all came to a consensus on this work. Um, and you can see, I'm not gonna read through all five of those things, but it was really important to us that every piece of our vision had something that we could point back to, to say, this is why we are including it. Um, and I will say that also for our SEL for PA vision, which is very well aligned with this vision for New Jersey as well also operationalizes every aspect of that work. And so when you're doing this, you have to think about what information is most useful to drive your group. Um, what, is it a mission? Um, is it a vision? Is it goals? Is it a defining statement? Is it a document? For the Clayton Model Pilot Program, it was simply a document. We created a document that drove our work forward. Um, and so that's really up to you and up to the group to figure out what is going to work best for, for all of you. Great. So let's say you've got your vision. You have this aspirational piece of information that is burning for you and you feel very passionate about it. You wanna share this with other people. What do you do now? As a group, you have to collectively define viable activities. And I keep, I keep coming back to the word viable. It is important for them to be implementable activities. Establish an organizational structure and identify audiences who will understand why this work is important and what will be the outcome of the work as you see it. For the Clayton Model Pilot Program, I have in bold and underlined the word advocacy. I could do probably a three hour webinar on just that, what you see that word right there. It, the work that was involved in coordinating with state legislators in particular to advance the uh, passage of the law that supported the pilot program was varied and challenging and, um, and but well coordinated because we had already documents to support all of this work. And so basically what that looked like in the smallest amount of time that I can condense this to, <laughs> is we took the document um, that was pitching a three school pilot program to legislators and said, here's how this is work, work, here's why this work is important. Here are the outcomes that students experience as a result of this. And here is how it will benefit students in the future. We want to establish a pilot so that we can more rigorously and expansively test this because Clayton Public School District is a fairly socioeconomically and racially diverse school district. 
Um, but it is not enough for us to extrapolate some kind of large statewide policy off of one school's work. And so we wanted to make sure that we were piloting this in more diverse locations, essentially, and making sure that our evaluation was as rigorous as possible. Um, and so uh, the, the shortest story of what happened is we pitched this to legislators in February of 2020. Um, and so you know what happened in March of 2020. In February of 2020, we had legislators who said, we will write this legislation, get it passed and funded this cycle. It is going to happen. Well, that didn't happen because COVID happened. Um, what happened instead is since we were already in the year of legislators in our first year in 2020, we did get some CARES Act funding that supported a smaller expansion of this work. And then through 2021, as we were understanding how COVID was affecting students in our uh, and the New Jersey economy and school system, the, le the legislation eventually did get passed, but it did get pared down a great deal. So I initially said three schools. Um, the legislator who led the work said three counties, which would have been about um, 100 and 110, I think, elementary schools, somewhere it was over 100 elementary schools, which would have been a challenge to scale. We eventually settled on 10 because 10 was a way more manageable and scalable operation. It is in nine currently, and we are expanding to a 10th school over the summer this summer. So there will be 10 in the last two years of the program coming um, in the next year. I'm happy to talk more about that anytime. Uh, so if you want to hear more about what that process looked like, I'm currently doing the advocacy for this work in every budgeting cycle. I have to communicate what the outcomes are and communicate to legislators to make sure there's appropriate appropriations, budget appropriations for all of this work in every year. And my goal is not to, um, I'm not advancing a specific, uh, I'm not advancing a specific piece of legislation. All I'm saying is here's the reporting for this and then they decide what the budget is. They can, that's really up to the state to decide. And so the structure for this, for the Clayton model, New Jersey, so the state passes the budget every year and we never know how much money we're getting until July 1st. It is a really fun experience. And so July 1st, the budget comes out, we get it on a PDF, I control F Clayton, and then I see how much money we got. Uh, and it goes to uh, the New Jersey Department of Education, who are the administrators of the work. The New Jersey Department of Education absolutely loves Rutgers University. And so they work closely with them all the time. It flows to Rutgers University, who is the primary contractor. And then it flows to two separate organizations. The Clayton Public School District is the training center for this work. And so they have a trainer. Kate Hallinan is the Clayton model coordinator. She's at the training center. There are also two SEL specialists at the training center. Uh, and the Gloucester County Special Services School District, Stephanie Chambers is the SEL coordinator there who coordinates all of these specialists to actually go into the schools and do the actual work. Uh, and so this is how that organization kind of fleshed out. Uh, and that was actually determined for us. We didn't have, we could, we had no say over that. As soon as the legislation went to the state, the state that decided what the organizational structure was, was going to be. And so sometimes you will have a situation in which it is determined for you. Um, or in the case of the Youth Mental Health Advoc Advocacy Collaborative, we had much more latitude to decide as ourselves what the organizational structure of the group was going to be. And so we looked at the Youth Mental Health Advocacy Collaborative and decided that there needed to be more information translation uh, communicated collectively by all of us as we are able uh, to communicate the need for more aligned youth mental health supports. And so we decided that there were some artifacts that we needed. We needed some tools to go out there and talk about this work. So we created a white paper, which is public and I can share with anybody um, if you are interested in seeing it. We created an executive summary on the need for a youth mental health landscape and the need for the alignment of uh, youth mental health services. And over the last three months, we've been doing advocacy. I'm lucky enough to be uh, in the Youth Mental Health uh, Advocacy Collaborative with two other people who also do state level advocacy work all the time. And so they're in um, Department of Education uh, or um, the, the Education Committee hearings and Higher Education Committee hearings. And so they have relationships and are able to do that. So in your orange box, what are the potential group activities? Absolutely, Danielle. If you want to send me, if you want to DM me your email, I will happily send you um, the white paper. Uh, in the orange box, what are the potential group activities? And I'd suggest 
doing this as a group to the best of your ability. Um, whoever the leader of the group is or leaders of the group can then work to pare those down, establish who is going to work through those and what timeline it might happen. Um, the organizational structure and decision, de decision making process can be determined by the group. In the case of the Youth Mental Health Advoc Advocacy Collaborative, it was determined by the group. For Clayton model, it was determined for us. Uh, in a second, I'll talk about SEL for PA2. Um, that was um, not determined for us and will be determined in the future. We're, we're going to do that collaboratively. And then communication. I personally feel that communication is the top priority for any organization because people cannot know things unless they are communicated and communicated effectively. And so you have to find the vehicles, the things, the tools that people are going to see and use in the spaces that they will pay attention to them to make sure that your message is heard. And so making sure you have a very solid communication plan should be um, part of part of your work. And so at this point, you're like, you've got an organization. You've gone through all the orange boxes. Um, you've emailed me and asked a lot of questions and said, I don't know this section, how do, you, how do I do this? And I provide, happy to provide support and advice. But now you've got an organization to run. So here's some fast advice for, for that part of the work. Be clear on your goals and vision, as clear and concise as you possibly can be. And set goals and activities that align with the coalition's purpose. Finding your people is one of the most fun parts, in my view, of this work. Because in, in my view, this social, emotional, mental well-being support in particular, you find people who are very passionate and engaged in this work who already are aligned in many ways with the things that you're looking to do. And I have made not only strong colleagues who are also engaged in this work, but also friends who I can count on now for different aspects of advice and feedback who are well aligned with this, uh, well aligned with this work. Listen and respond, be curious. If you are the one who is organizing the work and you end up leading the development of an organization, Curiosity is a great way to think about your responses in any given scenario. People are going to have dissenting views. They're going to have alternate views. And so being curious and uncovering those things in a non-judgmental environment that you have established as a group collectively can help you advance your goals in ways that are often unexpected. Listening to out group members is a critically important part of developing cohesive groups and curiosity is a cornerstone of that work. Learn your context and know your gaps in knowledge. You have to develop an understanding of the community you are serving's needs. Um, and you have to understand the factors that influence the different issues. And you will not know all of this at the outset. That is okay. The idea here when you're forming a coalition, a collaborative, is that your collective wisdom, wisdom and effort is more impactful than your individual wisdom and effort. And so when you're bringing people together, you can all work together to identify these things. Um, identifying gaps in knowledge, critically important to advancing your mission. And I will also say, this can, also, this can often get lost, and it often gets lost in the tool development piece and communications development piece of this work. Keep the main thing the main thing. If you are focusing on youth mental health collabor uh, advocacy. The perspectives of teachers within classrooms are critically important related to youth mental health advocacy, but may not be the main thing. And so in every scenario, ask, is the thing we are developing reflective of our initial goal? And if you find yourself as a group continually in spaces in which the things that you're talking about do not relate to your goals, then it's time to reorient your goals and think about what you're going to do differently. But if the group is really committed to what that initial goal is, then it should be easy as a group or easier as a group to orient back to that original goal. Um, great. Last thing, last thing. And then, and then if you have some questions, I can stick around for a little bit. We've got a couple of minutes left. This is the last thing. I just want to share our vision for SEL for PA 
Karen Lehman and I are the co-leads of SEL for PA. PA. Uh, Stephanie Colvin Roy is also intimately involved in the development of SEL for PA and the Center for the Promotion of Social Emotional Learning in the Center for Schools and Communities. Um, and I just want to highlight over the last year, we got to rarely build the plane while it is on the ground. And so we got a collection of people engaged in our work. And so this is the outcome of that collective work. We had 68 social emotional learning professionals across the state engaged in the development of this vision. And over the next six months, we'll be engaging in activity development, organizational development to engage the vision that you see here, which is for every child in every Pennsylvania community to have access to proactive, aligned, sustainable, and effective social, emotional, and mental well being resources to ensure career readiness and a healthy contribution to fa their families and communities. If you are in Pennsylvania, please come join us on June 18th at 10 a.m. Uh, I will be leading that work. And then after that, establishing some additional dates that we can continue the work down over the next six months um, as we work together. And so does anybody have any questions or comments? I saw some, uh, I see in the chat, some people have DM'd me and I will make sure that I respond to those DMs as well. And I'll make sure I save the chat and respond. You know, any exit, oh, do I have one more slide, which I'll, Put up. That's me. That's what I look like. I'm not a torso. I'm a real person. So uh, please, my email is there. You're welcome to hit me up anytime. I'm happy to talk shop about this work anytime you'd like to. Thank you all for being here. I'm happy to um, happy to stick around for the next couple of minutes. Otherwise, I hereby release you six minutes earlier than the scheduled webinar time. I'm happy. I will stay on the next couple of minutes as well. If you if you want anybody wants to chat. Thank you so much. Uh, for being here today. Thank you, Dr. Whiting. It was very nice. Of course, of course. You know, I did. I, I hope you don't mind. I put your email in the chat as well. So. Absolutely. <laughs> Just in case anyone, uh, you know, anyone gets missed there. So. Thank you so much. I won't be here. I'll be out of town for the June meeting, but I will look for. Um, the next one and hopefully be able to join. So thank you. It'd be great to have you, Danielle. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so thank much. Thank you. This was Definitely. great. See you is soon. That June, is that June 18th meeting um, virtual or in person? Virtual. Okay, wonderful. See you then. Yeah. Hope to see you then. Thanks. Thank you very much for everything. Yeah, of course. Thanks for coming. <laughs>